Felipe, I'm in the economics department here, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Robert Schiller to the LSE this evening. Um, Robert Schiller is a world expert in the study of financial markets, the way these markets work, but I guess more often than not, the way these markets don't quite work right. I first came across uh, Professor Schiller's work when I was a postgraduate student in the late 1980s. We had to read one of his papers about the excess volatility of stock markets. And in fact, there was a bit of interest in the economics profession in this topic and in incorporating bubbles into macroeconomic models. Um, but that interest was somewhat short-lived. It happened after the 1987 stock market crash. And while everybody else was forgetting about the topic, Professor Schiller went on studying these issues. And in fact, he'd written the paper about excess volatility before the stock market crashed in 87. Um, so most of the time, um, people don't pay particularly attention to Professor Schiller's work when times are good. <laughs> and he warns of the dangers and excesses of uh, financial booms but now he has a lot of speaking engagements. <laughs> so we're more happy that uh, we were able to get him to come here to the LSE. Of course, now everybody is also talking about the financial industry, um, the problems it has, and uh, everybody has an opinion what should be done. If you go to the pub, a lot of people feel you should just put bankers in jail. So. Now Professor Schiller says, wait a minute, the financial industry isn't all bad. It can do a lot of good for society. Well, I can hardly think of an economist who has more moral authority to actually come and defend the financial industry than Robert Schiller. So the floor is yours for 45 minutes to tell us how we can make finance work for the good of society and then we'll take questions. I need help with the... Uh, I should clarify at the beginning, it sounds from my book title that I'm apologizing for the financial industry. Uh, and unfortunately, that view has been taken by a number of people. Uh, I need to get a new spam filter on my email. Uh, I have never gotten so many abusive emails uh, before. And someone in the news commented that uh, Lloyd Blankfein, who is the CEO at Goldman Sachs, should send me a note of thanks. <laughs> but, uh, uh, that's not how I view this book at all. Uh, it's not about apologizing for the financial sector. And it's really not about people. The, the first thing that we should recognize at the very beginning is that there are some nice people and there are some not so nice people, <laughs> right? something we can agree on. And we have both of them in finance. Okay? So if you're going to uh, react to the financial crisis by pulling out stories of some not very nice people in finance, you're really rediscovering the obvious, right? At any point in time, you can find and you can do that in any profession. So uh, some of the movies and books that have been written uh, about the financial crisis seem to me to be, uh, they're just kind of pandering to public anger about, about the crisis. It's natural to be angry, especially if you're unemployed. Uh, and right now we have a 10.9% unemployment rate in the Euro area, which makes this practically the Great Depression again. It's natural to be angry, but uh, we don't want to let that kind of thing color our thinking. So I've been teaching uh, finance at Yale University now for 25 years, and I, uh, I feel a little discomfort now because of this anger, because I, I'm kind of like training criminals in some people's <laughs> mind. And, uh, uh, at Yale University, uh, Morgan Stanley and uh, Goldman Sachs and other recruiters come and they, they give 
they, they get a classroom and they give a little talk and the Yale students who are interested show up. Lately, protesters show up as if there's something obviously immoral about this whole thing. Um, and so that troubles me. It reminds me, when I was a college student, the Vietnam War was going on and I remember hearing stories about ROTC instructors. That's training future soldiers on campus. And they were criticized for what they were doing. So I had the same feeling, like maybe I'm like teaching people to commit atrocities and I don't want to be doing that. So uh, I have this online course on Open Yale, which you can take anytime if you want to take my course for free, but I won't grade you. Uh, and in uh, Open Yale, I, I have even more people who are trying to, uh, who are, are getting their careers in finance launched through my instruction. And uh, I thought that uh, I should revise the course uh, after the crisis because I, I've been thinking more and more about the morality of what we're doing and, and, and the confidence people feel in their criticism of all of this. Um, and I wanted to get at it, so the book that I've just written was incorporated into that course. Uh, I'm not sure I answered all of, all of the question. But just to give you a flavor of what people feel about finance now, uh, in the New York Times, uh, there was a story a couple of months ago by Catherine Rampell, who is a very clever young uh, writer, picks up interesting facts. Uh, she, her article, uh, which all she did to research this article is she wrote to both to Harvard, Yale, and Princeton and asked each of them to estimate what fraction of their graduating undergraduates went into finance. And she just reported <coughs> by year. And all three universities uh, complied with her request. And in a nutshell, about 25% of the graduating class went into finance just before the crisis. It's down after the crisis, as you might expect. Uh, the record was Princeton, uh, which had 46% of its class go into finance in 2006. Now, what, I don't know how you feel about this. Probably the same thing happened here in this country, right? But it doesn't matter. The question is, how do you feel about that? And most people feel there's something really wrong with that. Uh, because wh why? I don't know. People say, whatever happened to science or engineering or school teachers or helping <laughs> professions? All these guys are... What is it? What is it about? Do you have that feeling too when you reflect on this? Uh, now, I don't know what the right percentage that ought to go into finance is. Um, but uh, I, 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 I react to that by thinking about the, the stage in history we're in now. Uh, we are in a... What will historians remember about the general, our life, the age of our lifetimes? maybe hundreds of years from now, what will they say? Probably not much. It's a scary thought to think about that. <laughs> not much at all. They'll remember that they first conquered outer space. Maybe that would be one thing. Uh, that, that they will remember. But I think the other thing that they'll remember is that so much of the world became advanced. The emerging countries had this rapid economic growth. And, and you know, all over the world, it's, it, it's really true if you look at the, say the IMF data on economic growth rates, every region of the world outside of the advanced countries has had really strong economic growth. And I think that has to do with our uh, spread of financial capitalism. And I think uh, that it relates to the fact that we have ways now, financial ways, of creating organizations and, uh, that work uh, really well in, in fulfilling our goals. That is, uh, finance tells us about defining ownership, defining ownership not just of farmland, but of activities, activities that people can get involved in and can promote. It divides ownership up into shares, and it spreads them out over different people who, for, relative to their contributions. It defines, it creates price discovery for claims on ownership. That's called the stock market. It, uh, it creates price discovery for complicated things like the price of time at various intervals in time. And it allows people to be incentivized in a focused way 
and the risk that they encounter in some activity to be managed. Now, now you were talking about my bubble story. Some people claim that when I say things like this, that I am a uh, split personality <laughs> because I, I pointed out, uh, I've been arguing that there's excess volatility for, throughout much of my career and that markets don't work so well. Um, but then I come around and say these things. Well, I think the problem is that the truth is in between. And it, it's, not, I, uh, it's not necessarily a good didactic technique to have to give such contradictory <laughs> theories. But we don't have clean and simple theories in economics that fit everything. Uh, the economic system is just too complex. And it, it, uh, insights that you get from uh, mathematical finance are definitely valuable but of limited value unless the theory takes into account complexities of our civilization. Particularly, we need behavioral finance, behavioral economics. And I, I, I'm actually very positive about the economics profession because I've seen it grow and change over my career. And uh, behavioral economics, I believe, is a respected part of economics. Uh, so I, think, I think you have to be eclectic. Uh, but getting back to finance, uh, one idea I had in writing this book is to think of a new etymology for the term finance. Uh, what I want to say is that finance is about goals or goal architecture. And my etymology goes this way. Look up finance in a dictionary and it will say that it comes via Old French from the Latin finis, uh, which is what they used to put at ends of books. It means end. Okay? And why would finance be named from the word finis? Well, one, one dictionary said they used to write finis on a financial contract when it was paid. And so people saw finis written all over financial contracts that were old, and they thought that was the name of this thing. So it became finance. So maybe that's the correct, I don't know if they really know how words get formed. But I have another more imaginative explanation why finance came from Finis. And that is this. I checked in a Latin dictionary, classical Latin. Finis in ancient Rome had two meanings, just as end has two meanings in modern English. End means the end of the road, and it also means goal or purpose, right? You can ask, what are your ends? The same thing was true in Latin. Finis meant both end of the road or end of the book, and it meant goal or purpose. So I like to imagine that uh, finance was named as it was because it's really the art of achieving our goals in life. Um, so it's the, the thing, it's about financing activities. That's how I want to view it. So it, it, it's not about making money. <laughs> uh, it's about making things happen. And the, the problem is that most goals that any of us have can't be achieved by one person alone. Think of anything that you might aspire to, and can you do it all by yourself? No, you can't do it. Maybe you could be a poet all by yourself, and okay, you could memorize, you could sit in a solitary confine, confinement and write poetry in your head and memorize it as you go, and you wouldn't even need pencil and paper. But you wouldn't be a poet for having done that, because poetry is an activity that requires um, poetry readings, publishers, uh, that sort of thing. And I have a little story in my book about one poet, Walt Whitman, and all of the business activities he got into to try to promote his poetry. Uh, most, so, so that's the idea, that uh, everything we do involves an organization. And, and it also has to be consistent through time, that uh, most people come and go in and out of activities. You'll be enthusiastic for a while, Maybe if you're really a long-winded person, you could be enthusiastic about something for 10 years. Um, but that's uh, not long enough for most purposes. So finance is about stewardship, about achieving goals. And it's about writing complicated contracts that make it possible for people to get involved in organizations. So that's why we need high, sometimes we need high executive compensation for a, an organization. People say, why do you have to pay them so much? 
Well, there's a number of issues. Sometimes there's corruption. Cronyism is, is causing someone to be overpaid. But on the other side, sometimes you have to motivate someone who has the right skills and talents into a position who's really not interested in it. But you, that somebody else needs that person. And so it naturally happens that CEO salaries sometimes get high. See, everything is a mixture. I think sometimes these multi-million pound salaries are warranted. Other times they're evidence of corruption. But sometimes they are warranted. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, my book was started before Occupy Wall Street. But I think of Occupy Wall Street as just the phenomenon. Uh, do you know the history of it? it was, it's a Canadian. Um, discovery. There was a, a, a group in Vancouver who, called Adbusters who uh, liked to try to think of ways to uh, create publicity for their uh, idealistic worldview. So they thought of screen-free week. And they thought if we tell the whole world, let's have one week when you never look at your computer, your television, or your mobile phone, uh, maybe that will remind everyone that human values are really important. Did anyone hear of Screen Free Week? See, it didn't. Oh, you did. OK. It didn't really work. Then they thought, hey, let's create a, um, a, uh, a, some kind of occupation of the business office or of business community. And that will kind of resonate. Maybe it could generate publicity. And I, I'm imagining someone in Vancouver said, well, we should do that in New York, not in Vancouver. So they, they arranged a protest in Zuccotti Park near Wall Street. And that was their big success. It's a social epidemic. It's like a bubble. It's a contagion phenomenon. But it was revealing something underlying that people are angry. Part of what I'm getting at here is that I think that finance is an invention. And there's a technology in finance. And the unfortunate thing is that if someone is motivated by Occupy Wall Street or Occupy London, what should they do? Well, you can go out on the street and protest, and that might, that probably was a good thing when it happened, but it's only the first step. What is the second step? After you've gotten people's attention that something is wrong, there's rising inequality and there's some bad things happening in, in finance. What is the second step? Well, it seems to me it is, has to be to get involved with fixing finance. We're not going to go back. The, the problems are technical in nature and have to, be, uh, have to be fixed by technicians. That means you have to take my course or some course like it. And, and you have to risk getting involved with those loathsome people in, in finance. Uh, but I think one can do that with one's head held high. Now, Paul Volcker, uh, who is the former chairman of the Federal Reserve in the United States, is widely quoted for a statement he made two years ago. Uh, and that is, he said, about financial innovation, I can't think of any good financial innovation in recent memory other than the automatic teller machine. <laughs> and so uh, and, uh, people think that Paul Volcker is a genius. And I, I think he's a smart man, but we overrate our celebrities. And that really, in truth, was an offhanded remark and not a well-considered remark. So I want to consider it and think about financial innovation. There is actually, maybe you felt this, skepticism, especially when you think of CDOs or other uh, uh, things that developed in this crisis, subprime mortgage securities uh, that blew up and hurt uh, many investors. But uh, so I thought what I want to do uh, for the rest of this talk is, is, um, is give uh, my view of some innovations. First thing I want to talk about uh, proof that Paul Volcker is wrong. And I'll talk about some recent innovations in finance uh, that uh, are inspiring. Uh, and then I want to go to some future innovations. And then I'll we'll conclude open this to questions. Uh, but the first thing, we have to establish that Paul Volcker is wrong, that not all of these innovations are corrupt or uh, uh, self-serving by uh, financial authorities. So let me start with some. Now, w one thing I want to say in understanding these innovations is that to someone 
who was trained in academic finance, say, five or ten years ago, and never paid any attention to behavioral finance, they might not sound like innovations. The reaction would be, what's that? What's good about that? Usually, financial innovations that, that are telling are ones that relate to human behavior and errors that people make, or, or human motivation, or what activates people. So the first example that I want to give is uh, the invention uh, 18 months ago, or I say the implementation of the first benefit corporation law. So let me tell you about this. B Labs in the United States is an, a, a nonprofit organization that wants to improve the corporation. They have a new corporate charter, a new corporate law that they invented. And the law uh, defines a new kind of company that's halfway between for-profit and non-profit. Right now, you either have to be a for-profit corporation or a non-profit, you know, charitable or, or, or the like organization. And, uh, okay, the basic idea, it's very simple and it sounds like nothing, but it's not nothing. I think it's extremely important. You can now, in eight U.S. states, they're, they're, in the U.S., you have to do it separately for each state because corporate law is a state, not a federal thing. So they're going around to all 50 states trying to get state legislatures to approve this. It's now in st eight states. If, in those states, you can set up a corporation, a benefit corporation, and it's identified as such. And there's two purposes. One is to make profits for your shareholders. The other, you specify. It, it's some charitable, or some social or environmental cause. Uh, and that's all. That's what a benefit corporation is. But it's very important because, especially in the United States, corporate law requires a, a duty of loyalty of boards of directors to the shareholders. This is a reaction to some scandals in the past where uh, boards were shipping money off to some cronies. And they, they justified it as charitable or something. So the law became focused on, you have to pay the money to the shareholders. It's up, the shareholders own the business, and the shareholders can give it to charity if they want, but it shouldn't be the corporation who does it. This was very much ingrained in our thinking. I'm, I'm sure it was, but it's basically the same in the UK. That seemed very clean and correct for financial theorists. But the problem is that it, doesn't necessarily work well in terms of motivating employees, making them feel benevolent to their corporation or to the, or to the community. So a benefit corporation, I'll give you an example of a benefit corporation. Uh, there's, all, there's about 20 or 30 of them now in the US. There's a corporation, they're all little, none of them is a success yet. This is too new. This is still an experiment. I, I'm not saying it's going to work, but I'm optimistic. There's a corporation called Growers Secret. It's a fertilizer company. And their statement as to what their purpose is, is to improve the NPK balance of the planet. Uh, how many people here know what we're talking about? I got one. Does anyone else know? Two. All right. That sounds about right. Most of you don't even know what this cause is. Well, NPK balance is nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium balance in the ocean, which is threatened. This is like global warming, but it's gotten less publicity. Fertilizer is running off into the ocean and throwing off the balance of these elements. Some people worry about this and are animated by this. You create a, uh, you create a corporation like this, which is going to produce fertilizer that doesn't do that, and it will attract a clientele of interested people who are just we all have our own causes, and we're anim maybe animated by them. So you work for this company, and you feel like you've fulfilled some part of your inner identity. You love the fact that this corporation is do dedicated to NPK balance, which you, among very few people, recognize as such an important problem. So people have a different sense of who they are and why they're working. I think that ultimately, this kind of corporation may have a higher profit potential because of human behavior, even though you might say from a pure financial theory standpoint that it's unfocused. My second example is from the UK now, and this is the social impact bond. Again, within the last two years. Although talk about it goes back 
to the late 1990s. I, I first heard about this idea from a New Zealand economist, Ronnie Horish, uh, who's been advocating them for now a long time. But the first social impact bond was in the UK. And uh, I'll give you, what it is is a bond that issued by the government that pays out only if some important social or environmental problem is solved. So I, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, the uh, Ministry of Justice in the UK issued a social impact bond uh, whose pay, which would pay to the investor only if the reincarceration rate of prisoners released from the Peterborough prison fell by 7.5% or more with a six-year term. Okay? The problem apparently with the Peterborough prison is that after they released prisoners for some offense, after they'd served their time, they end up right back in prison because they did it again. So they must have been hiring social workers or the like to help work with them, give them jobs or something. But it just isn't working. So what do you do? The idea of a social impact bond is open it up to the market. Can anyone figure out what to do with this problem? So what they managed to do was sell five million pounds worth of these bonds to investors who believed in organizations that would then work with the, the, the prisoners. And the money went to pay the people in the organizations. And then they will be paid out uh, with a presumably handsome reward if it works. So what we've done is we've created an incentive for those people who know, who have ideas and are willing to stake their money on it, on how to fix this problem. Now, there's an underlying idea, which is a core idea of capitalism that underlies this. And it goes back to uh, Friedrich Hayek, who wrote about this in the 1940s. But not, not just him, but many others. But the point is that it's hard to centralize knowledge. And it, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to um, know who to turn to, to solve a problem like the Peterborough prison problem. And the beauty of capitalism is that problems are opened up to, to all sorts of people. We have, you know, uh, well, let me, let me go to my third example now. And this is uh, also, this is really the most recent of all of them. It's only one month old. In fact, I would say it hasn't even hatched yet. But let me tell you, it's crowdfunding. Now, we have predecessors of it of, uh, you may already know about. But let me tell you what I'm, what I'm specifically talking about. In uh, just last month, the United States Congress passed what they call the Jobs Act. And that stands for not what you think it is. It's not about jobs, per se. This is politics. They name things in creative ways. Jobs means, stands for, the letters stand for Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act. And it has many features to it, but Title II of the Act is about crowdfunding. Now, you may already know about crowdfunding because there's a number of websites that do it. But the idea, do it something like what? This is to really make it work. Uh, there's a website called kiva.org that you can get on. And you can, uh, if you feel like some kind of charity work or helping the poor, you can make a small loan to somebody in some very poor part of the world. You know, $25 to some farmer who needs to buy fertilizer or something like that. And you might get paid back, but it's small. And, you, know, it might, you might want to try that. Uh, it, but, uh, so the idea is, could we create websites that generate enough money for a business, a real business, to get started? Uh, and that's the idea. It's not been possible until now to really start a, uh, a, a, a crowdfunding for, um, for a business startup. The reason not is that laws in every country prevent you from doing this kind of trade with the public because there is a concern about ripoffs. That it'll be, if, you, if you're, I, do, do, maybe I didn't make it clear what I'm saying. The idea is you have some idea for a business, like something, to, something obscure maybe, like NPK balance or something. And you, you, you go to uh, Wall Street, you go to venture capital firms, and you try to sell it on them. And I tell you, this happens all the time. They're mysteriously uncomprehending. They're MBAs or something. You know? And they get a lot of things. They're, they're really smart. But don't be fooled. They don't have the insights that somebody who's been thinking about NPK balance for years and is in, incentivized by it might. 
And there's a lot of people out there who think about these things. At least this is one view of the world that I think has something to it. So let's create a website. You put your business idea up on the website, open it up to the whole world, and the website, by the way, will put any comments on it. And so if this works, within you know, two days there'll be 250 comments on it by people who may know a lot. It's a little bit like Wikipedia, right? You, you know, it, it, there's so many people out there that know things, specialized things. And then each person can contribute, a, can buy a small number of shares in the organization. So it's a whole different idea from traditional venture capital. And so will it work? Well, one thing is uh, th this act creates a barrier toward abuse by requiring that everybody, that no one can put more than 5% of their income in if their income is under 100000 And th that means nobody is going to get wiped out by uh, abusive. That, that would be combined overall. They've got to keep track of each other so that they're, they're, and we can do this now with computers. Um, so before long, I think we'll see a lot of crowdfunding. Uh, it hasn't actually taken place yet because the law is too new and it hasn't been in. Regulatory rules haven't been written yet, but we'll see it soon. Now I want to move to the future. Do you see where I'm getting at? That we're, that we're inventing around human problems and we're taking account, we're democratizing, we're trying to bring more people in, more inclusive uh, economics. Uh, and uh, ultimately I think it will lead to a more egalitarian society. And beyond that, it's not just inequality. I'm talking about getting an economy where people's own personal goals seem to be an activity for them. That I, I'm interested in certain kinds of problems. I want to work on that. And then there, there's ways to do that that are real. You don't get stuck in some humdrum, dead-end uh, occupation. You do things that are meaningful to you. So my next uh, idea, now, now this is an idea in my book that is new. Um, and even more untested than these other ideas I've just described. Uh, and so I've, I'm proposing another kind of corporation that I call a participation nonprofit. Uh, it, now, this is strictly nonprofit in contrast to a benefit corporation, but I think it might work better. Now, the thing about capitalism is that it generates high wealth for some. And if you just saw the Times of London had the uh, rich list 2012, and I think it said there's 70 billionaires in the UK. Uh, so th this country, like the US, is pretty unequal. But you know, what's, how do we make sense out of a country and an economy that does that? Uh, one thing we could do is make it impossible for anyone to be a billionaire. Uh, I think that would be overreacting because somehow the possibility of getting a billion dollars uh, or at least a large fortune is, is motivating uh, to people. Uh, but, I th but I think it ultimately makes sense only if people give it away, ultimately. And I, I, I can't imagine what sense is made out of making a billion dollars and leaving it to your children, <laughs> as people seem to be want. That is the most nonsensical thing to do, because basically your children are like random draws out of the gene pool, realistically. Why do you want to transfer a billion dollars to a random uh, person? <laughs> and so it, it's an absurd conclusion to it. But, but see, people have this acquisitive in, uh, impulse and they want to accumulate. It's, it's like what motivates you to get out of bed in the morning? And so you can fall, suppose you did think of some business opportunity that might make you a billionaire. And it, you'd probably find it kind of fun, right? And, you, you can get into the swing of things without ever thinking, what am I going to do with a billion dollars? <laughs> and I think these people have no idea what they'll do with a billion dollars. So we, we, what we have to do is somehow motivate charity at, at, a, at a deeper level so that it's somehow psychologically more satisfying. Now, I think it's the same in the UK as in the US, but we get these calls at dinner time from charitable causes. And there are always causes that we sympathize with. Uh, I realize that's because they have a computer database of people <laughs> like us. And so the more you give to them, the more calls you get. And there's someone reading from a script. It sounds manipulative, you know, and they try to get you to donate. If you say, okay, I'll donate, you know what happens? They hang up and you are now on another computer database <laughs> that will increase the f number of phone calls 
that you will get in the future. So it, it seems a little bit, something just, can, can you imagine spending your whole life earning a billion dollars and at the end of your life you get a phone call and you say, okay, I'll donate a billion dollars. <laughs> it's your whole life's work. It's just anticlimactic. There should be something better than that. Uh, so my proposal, uh, the participation nonprofit, is trying to make it more fun, uh, make it more of a, uh, and, and more sort of engaging. So anyway, you, you can d agree or disagree, but the idea is this. The new kind of nonprofit, which would say run a hospital or a school, it doesn't ask for donations. It sells shares. But it is nonprofit. So you can buy shares in this school or hospital, and then the school or hospital has to pay out all of its profits to your account. The only difference between it and a for profit corporation is that that account is now restricted to charitable purposes. You can't take it out and give it to your children. But you can take it out and, um, and give the um, proceeds to uh, a college or university. By the way, is this room named after someone? It didn't say that. It just says great theater. Well, okay. In the future, the LSE is going to sell the, the name to this. Do they do that sort of thing here? If, if it doesn't work here, you can come to Yale University and you can buy the name of our business school or our law school. I'm, not, I'm, I'm joking here, but the thing is, that would be you see, people are basically egotistical. Not totally, but it's part of what happens. And people, what else can you do with a billion dollars but something like that? So what I'd like to see, or even less sums than that, what I'd like to see uh, is let's make a playable game in a sense. The same way they, there's a game in the stock market. It animates people. They watch every day. So I want to create something like that. So this is what happens with a, with a participation nonprofit. You try to invest in a charity that will be effective, not a charity, a hospital or a school, a nonprofit activity. And if they're effective and you're right, you see your account growing, you're, you're amassing more and more of a fortune. It's all dedicated to nonprofits. And the fact that it's nonprofit will improve community support for it, it will improve the attitude of the workers. And at the same time, it engages people. It also solves the so called capital lock in phenomenon that's been. Uh, used to criticize nonprofits, including universities, okay, which are uh, uh, private universities are always non, almost always nonprofits. So uh, the problem is that the university or the hospital is really not doing very well. It's, it's got poor management, or it's in the wrong place. There's something wrong, but it keeps making money and it keeps plowing it back in. Say it's a hospital in a city that uh, not doesn't really need more hospital beds. <laughs> But there it is, and it's going to exist there forever, according to its charter, and it keeps putting money back in. So which, what, the, what this thing would make it different, the, the, the stockholders could pull it all out and push it somewhere else. So they have kind of oversight, in the, like in a corporate uh, shareholders, and they can make sure that it's used better. Anyway, I'll move on. I, I, I have another five minutes or so. Uh, yeah. So. Um, uh, there are many ideas that I talk about in the book, all of them untested. <laughs> maybe, maybe some of them are, are crazy, uh, but uh, uh, I think that uh, they, they at least are suggestive of the kinds of things that ought to happen in the future. So uh, uh, let me talk about mortgages. The, uh, the, the crisis that we're in was caused by, in both the U.S. and the U.K., more dramatically in the U.S., by falling home prices after a bubble and uh, uh, leveraged positions that people take who borrow to buy a house. So if you buy a house with a fixed mortgage and the home price falls, your interest payments don't go down, but your, uh, the value of your debt doesn't go down, but the value of your house goes down. So you can be t insolvent. You can have negative net worth. In the United States today, according to one estimate, about Almost a quarter of all homes with mortgages are underwater right now because we've had something like a 35% home price decline. And people were borrowing only like 5 or 10% of the value of the home. And so if you're underwater on your mortgage, it means that you're, and especially since most people put almost all their life savings into the house, typically at least, 
You're, you're, you have negative wealth. You've been wiped out with your life savings. And you can't move easily because you can't sell the house and pay off the mortgage with the proceeds. So why did we let that happen? It's, it's bad. Uh, it's, it's financially irresponsible. I find it strange. After I've been teaching finance uh, so many years and telling people that leverage creates risk, it's like the most fundamental thing. Uh, and uh, nobody seemed to pay any attention to it. Uh, and there was this strangest phenomenon, which I'm still trying to understand, that people thought that home prices can never fall. And I think they really believe that. Or they would say they can fall, but they won't fall for very long. They'll be right back up. Uh, well, they fell, and we got in trouble. So what should we be doing now? We should be fixing the mortgage system. And there's, there's different ways of doing it. Uh, the way I proposed is to, is to create an automatic workout built into the mortgage when you take it out, which says that if home prices fall, we reduce your balance immediately. Uh, and so then you can't get underwater. We design it so that you can never get underwater. And, and so I, I think we could issue these mortgages, price in the risk of home price fall. We have many finance graduate students who can figure out what the appropriate price for that mortgage is. Uh, and we can securitize them and sell them off to investors all over the world who will bear the risk. Instead of it being focused on the homeowner, it's spread out over portfolios. Uh, and it, it, it's just a smarter way to do things. Uh, this kind of thing is not talked about much. The uh, Dodd-Frank Act in the, in, in the United States, which was the principal response to the crisis by the U.S. Congress, calls for a study of alternative mortgages. Um, and it demanded that uh, our U.S. government produce the study by January of 2011. And we still don't have it. Uh, that was a year ago. But it's hard to get things going like this, but I think that's where we have to go. The next idea I want to talk about uh, was an idea I just presented at the Bank of England. Uh, I told them, you should do this. <laughs> so, but as an experiment, the, I mean, not you. The Bank of England doesn't manage the, uh, the national debt. The debt management office does. So they should, the DMO, sh I think, should do that. What should they do? The UK government should issue shares in its GDP. This sounds almost like Milton Friedman. He actually didn't say this. Uh, he talked about issuing shares in a lot of different things. My, my Canadian colleague, Mark Kempstra, has suggested calling these trills and defining the share as one trillionth of, of GDP. So uh, uh, they, would, they, they would pay a dividend. This is a, it's a very simple concept. The shares would pay a dividend equal, one share would pay each year one trillionth of the GDP of that year. So if the UK had done this last year, the dividend they would have paid would be one pound 78. Or uh, I think that's what the GDP, well, it was 1.78 trillion pounds last year. If the US issued it, it would be uh, 15.09 dollars. That's one trillionth of US GDP. If Canada did it, I'm, they should all do it, by the way. That's our proposal. It would be just under two Canadian dollars uh, per share. Uh, now, why do we want to do that? Well, it, again, I, it, I can't completely summarize my reasoning on all this in short time, but, uh, and, and Marx, uh, we're now working together on this, but uh, the idea is leverage again. I wanted to continue the workout mortgages that I described to lower the leverage of homeowners and get them out of this position where they get in trouble when things go bad. Well, I want to do the same for the government. The, what we're going through right now in the UK and in the US and in Europe and lots of places is that the economy is disappointing, but the debt doesn't get reduced. The governments have debt, but their tax revenue is going down because GDP is falling. Or at least it's more dramatically, you could say it's falling below expectations. In the UK, it's actually falling uh, recently um, in real terms uh, for the last two quarters. So uh, the, what the government has done is gotten itself in a leveraged situation with debt. So it would be much more comfortable for the government if they would issue shares instead of debt. Uh, now, companies do this already. Companies don't. They have two forms of raising money. One is through two basic forms. One is equity and one is debt. We talk about all the 
nuances of that in corporate finance, but public finance, I'm coming to an end. All right, I just want to, I do want to get one more thing in if I can, and that's because it, it, it's motivating for Occupy Wall Street, and that is, I think that, uh, this, is another, this is my last proposal, and it's again an experiment. Uh, well, maybe it's more than an experiment in this case. I think the government of the world should index their tax system against inequality. That means pass a law now that says that if inequality increases, if it gets worse than it is today, that taxes on the rich will automatically go up in order to prevent inequality after tax from increasing. And in, in short, I can't say these things. You have to read my book to get the full <laughs> idea. But in short, this is what I think happened. Inequality has been getting worse now for decades in the UK, in the US, and in much of the world. We have no plan to make it better. We have reasons to worry that this trend will continue and it will get a lot worse. For example, I'm saying reasons to worry, not proof that it will get worse. For example, all of these computer devices are replacing jobs at a rapid rate. They're, you know, that mobile phone means you don't need a taxi driver anymore because you know exactly where to go. All that skill the taxi driver has developed over years is all suddenly obsolete. This kind of thing is happening rapidly and God knows where it will be in 30 years. And so what does that mean about income inequality? I think it means high risks. So now how do we address that? The first thing to do, the most obvious thing to do, is to develop a plan. And we're, it's much easier to develop a plan about the future than about waiting until it happens and then after the fact raising taxes. So that's, that, that's my last proposal. And I'll, I'll stop because we have to leave time for, maybe I'll come back here. <laughs> Thank you very much for these uh, certainly very stimulating ideas. And uh, I throw it open to the audience. I'll leave it to you. Oh, well, at the very far, yeah. Good evening. Uh, I'm Stuart Theobald. I'm a PhD student here. Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, it seems to me I'm about halfway through your book and, and listening to your talk that you pin the financial crisis largely on, a, on being an engineering failure. And you talk at length about the benefit finance has to offer society from engineering improvements as a social engineering project. I wonder though, all engineering depends on some basic scientific body of theory. And I wonder if you view the financial crisis as having exposed some failure or some weakness in the underlying body of financial theory, by which I mean capital market theory from Markowitz through to value at risk modeling, et cetera. Because in, uh, just as a contrast, the Turner Review in the UK was quite clear that they felt that something, you know, basic assumptions underlying the practice of finance were exposed as being faulty, particularly the use of statistics and so on. So apart from being an engineering problem, is there a problem with the underlying theory, the, the science of finance itself? Well, I, I, th I think that we are becoming more aware of well, what happens in academic research is they often run with a idea and carry it too far. So there was a revolution in finance. You mentioned Markowitz that started, say, in the 1950s uh, that led to a mathematical theory called the capital asset pricing model. Uh, and it was a theory of uh, strictly rational behavior. And beyond that, it specified certain desires that people have. They weren't worried about their personal identity or things like that, or self-esteem. They just wanted to maximize their wealth. But it was an exciting thing, and it went, uh, it went, uh, you know, the, the problem is that people carry these things too far and they forget incongruent facts and become, uh, uh, it, it led to an efficient markets attitude that uh, dismissed the idea of bubbles. 
in their enthusiasm for the new rational financial theory, you will find that the word bubble was forgotten. I did a search through finance textbooks from 30 years ago, and you look up bubble in the index, and it is not there. Zero. Uh, now it's come back after the crisis. So we, we're going through another revolution that I think will correct the errors of the past. Uh, the, the first lesson, as a gra you said you're a graduate student, is it's your job to do that. So you have to overthrow the theory, <laughs> at least overthrow the excesses of the theory and put it in its place, which means it wasn't as good as the uh, framers thought, but it's still useful to refer to. You also referred to the use of statistics. Uh, and I, you, you know, I don't think that it's smart to object to the use of statistics in any field of uh, inquiry. But I think maybe what you're driving at is the, a kind of pseudo-professionalism that infected some thinking. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, I was at a conference around 2005, and a man was developing an econometric time series analysis of home prices. And he had home prices for a very short sample period, like from 1997 to 2005, like eight years. And uh, he developed this model that implied a strong uptrend for home prices. So I raised my hand and I said, uh, isn't I just looked at your data. It's only the bubble period. I used the word bubble, and it's kind of not, not politically correct at the time. So he had an advantage over me. I was this crackpot using that word. So he's kind of stiffened and, and, and said, look, we have very good data going back to 1998. That's all we have. I'm not going to use earlier data, which is suspect. <laughs> so he, he kind of reacted in a uh, way that you know, we professionals do it this way. And he felt kind of safety and security in uh, informing that. that the, the problem is, it, it's, it goes back to this idea that home prices never fall. Well, they never fell in your sample period. Um, and then, it, then the question, did they ever fall? And the amazing thing is, he doesn't know, you know? He doesn't care. <laughs> he's trying to get his PhD or whatever. And he's trying to prove that he's got all the methods right. And, He's not going to look at old data because he knows he'll be criticizable, but that data has potential flaws. But you can go back and read newspapers from the 1930s. And the newspapers, there's no price indices. There's no solid data. But they say home prices are crashing. <laughs> so they probably were crashing. And you can learn some elementary facts that home prices do go down. But you get a kind of excessive professionalism that can lead to a kind of group think. Uh, self-deception. I think that's what happened. Okay, uh, yeah, up, right there. Uh, thanks, Professor Schiller. Uh, Vic, my name is Victor Hagani, and I just wanted to ask you a little bit about leverage. I have a bit of experience with that, uh, having uh, having worked at LTCM uh, at the uh, oh. exciting time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, one thing um, that um, I don't think you talk about too much in in your book um, is sort of this question of whether the banking function of um, lending long and borrowing short, you know, sort of how fundamentally important that is to, uh, you know, functioning economy and, and, and allowing growth. And sort of the, the question that I have is whether, you know, in looking back at uh, different financial crises, you know, it seems as though leverage is, is, is almost always at the center of it, um, you know, forcing people to sell things that they don't want to sell, or uh, you know, or causing causing different kind of loss of confidence, and I guess my question is, you know, there doesn't seem to be that much, um, you know, there doesn't seem to be that much interest in trying to move the financial system to much more of a uh, originate and distribute sort of model where banks, you know, where where banks are important in terms of their credit analysis, but. Um, and, and maybe to the extent that, that they want to hold things on their balance sheet, that they're just uh, that they can't do it with overnight 
uh, demand deposits. And um, I was just wondering, you know, that, that um, you know, what your thoughts were on that whole question. Yeah, uh, this is uh, a very difficult question that you, it, it's true that there is a demand for banking services. That's why it appeared. You want to put, you store your money somewhere and earn some interest. You want it to be safe and you want to earn some interest. And you can put it in the bank and the bank will then in, in, invest it in long-term assets like home mortgages so that that money is locked up and they can't get it out. You can take your money out at any way, at any time. This is a great invention in history, but it has a vulnerability. The vulnerability is that if everybody comes at the same time to ask it for the money out, the bank can't do that. So what should we do about this vulnerability? This has been a problem which has motivated financial theorists for a long time. Uh, so you seem to be suggesting some alternative that would eliminate the possibility of achieving this kind of liquidity that people are accustomed to in banks. So you can tell people that you can invest in mortgages, but you will be stuck for the long term. Effectively, you could have institutions that do something more like that. Um, so what, uh, what should we do? I, I, I'm, inclined, I'm inclined to think that regulation of banks can help reduce the long-term capital management that you described was not regulated as a bank. Uh, it, 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 and one thing that we're doing with financial reform is bringing more regulation to entities like that. Uh, so it's a delicate equilibrium. This is what I'm talking about finances involving complex engineering like uh, innovate. So banks have gotten better. The UK had no bank run before um, Northern Rock since 1866, I think it was. So the UK had pretty much figured out how to avoid them. And even uh, Northern Rock wasn't a disaster. They bailed it out and they stopped the run. Um, and so uh, suitable discretionary bailouts seem to work. But uh, I think that's the way. I know there's other proposals to fix the banking system, but, uh, and I don't claim to have evaluated them. But my instinct is, to, is that the banking system is useful. I suppose we could live without it, but I don't think we need to. And uh, some kind of uh, regulatory improvements will, will defer another bank run for another 100 years. So uh, we're, uh, OK, uh, you have the mic there. Hello, thank you. My name's Grant. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the proper relationship uh, between government and the private sector is in your perfect, uh, or in your good society. <laughs> and spe uh, specifically, like incentivizing people. I'm thinking, you know, for uh, retirement, maybe opt in, or somebody has to opt out versus opting in. So anything that you can say about that would be great. Thank you. Uh, that's a you give me these really broad, uh, difficult. <laughs> I guess when I write a book called Finance and the Good Society, I open myself up <laughs> to really broad uh, questions. So uh, uh, I don't know what to say in general about this. That uh, our our civil society has a fundamental role for the government. Uh, as well, David Moss wrote a book called When All Else Fails the government as, let, as ultimate risk manager. That ultimately we have a society that is capable of trumping any financial arrangement. And so uh, one thing that, and there are problems that cannot be solved by financial arrangements. For example, the problem that the unborn children of the future are not here to express their, or to take positions in financial markets that will protect their interest. So we believe, it's our philosophy, that the government has a responsibility to unborn generations in the future. And that responsibility cannot be dealt with by financial markets. Uh, so I think that we need social welfare and uh, we need, uh, that, that's an important part of finance and it's inherently government. So uh, the other thing, I don't know, you said something about incentivizing people. Uh, and th there's a, uh, there's a fundamental problem right now in the UK and the US of inadequate demand so that we are below our potential uh, uh, rate of output. And it's causing the nations to go into debt 
and it's causing austerity programs, especially in the UK. Uh, and so um, what, what we seem to be doing is hoping that people will start spending again. Uh, and, and then all our problems will be solved if they would, but we won't take any action anymore to make that happen. And so there's a fundamental problem is that, well, people aren't spending because people aren't spending. It's this self-fulfilling prophecy. It's kind of a, a, a stupid problem that we have. There's no reason. This is what uh, our president, Franklin Roosevelt, said in the 1930s. Uh, there is no plague of locusts. There's nothing wrong with the economy in 1933. The only thing to fear is fear itself. So he tried moral exhortation. Come on, go out there and start spending. If you all do it, we'll be fine. There's just nothing wrong. We're in exactly that position in the UK today. So how do we get people spending again? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that it's only government stimulus. And I, I have written a number of editorials in newspapers saying we should go back to the balanced budget stimulus. If we're concerned about national debt, the government has to tax people and spend the money. It just makes up for the missing aggregate demand. And then it'll bring unemployment down, it'll bring the economy back, and I think they can ease off. They just never did that enough. They, they never created enough demand. Uh, the, the, I'm referring to an old economic literature from the 1940s of William Salant and Paul Samuelson who began advocating <laughs> balanced budget government stimulus uh, for the, the contingency. They thought that after World War II, the, the world might slip back into depression. And the government had such high debt then that they couldn't do deficit spending. So that was their solution. It, it never has been used until, uh, never really needed it until now. So that's my proposal. I have lots of, that's in the book too, but it's all over. My proposal to the British government, uh, I don't know that it's politically feasible, but let's just talk about what they should do. They should raise taxes and raise expenditure and just get the economy going again without raising the debt. And by the way, that doesn't mean the government hiring bureaucrats with the money who will sit at desks and do useless things. It means spending the money on things that other people would like to be spending the money on if we weren't in this economic slump. So it, it, it just seems the immediate and obvious thing to do to correct the situation, but it's just not in our vocabulary these days. So, uh, okay, right. Uh, you mentioned there's a great uh, increase in inequality with, boom, with a rise in billionaires and a reduction in the tax revenues in the developed countries. So wouldn't it be a good idea to go back to the old uh, uninnovated concept of taxing wealth as opposed to income? Uh, okay, so... Um, some countries have a wealth tax. Uh, my understanding is it's well, it, the, the true wealth tax, as opposed to income tax, is declining. Uh, Finland, uh, for example, eliminated its wealth tax a few years ago uh, amidst complaints that it's hard to measure wealth. Uh, a lot of wealth, you know, if someone owns a family estate, it's never been traded, you know, they've hold, held it for their lifetime, how do you value that? People can disguise and conceal wealth. I think that might be the reason. But, but you know, I don't oppose a wealth tax. It's kind of... In, in, by the way, you do have some, some kind of wealth tax in the UK in the form of an inheritance tax. So you already... If you call that a wealth tax, it's not applied annually. It's applied once a generation. So I guess you do have a wealth tax. Should we have an inheritance tax? I believe we should. Be, but it should be not, you know, it should be not 100 percent either, because people want to give money to their children. Uh, so I, I don't know. Are you asking that we re increase the UK inheritance tax? I don't even know what the rate. Does anyone know what the rate? What, it's 40 percent. 40 percent after the non uh, zero interest. Value. You know, that's interesting. If that's correct, I yes. I recently when it was not recently 20 years ago, I. <laughs> I think maybe that's... See, my memory is somehow different. 20 years ago seems recent to me. <laughs> but, um, I, I worked with Maxime Boyko and Vladimir Korobov 
in the la last days of the Soviet Union to do a comparison <coughs> of attitudes toward economics between Soviets and, well, between Muscovites and New Yorkers. And one question we asked is, what do you think is the inheritance tax that you would think reasonable to give when people die? And we got almost the same answer in New York and Moscow, amazingly. And as I remember, it was 37%. It's just amazingly close to your 40%. That's and that, cool. that suggests to me that there's a certain intuitive logic that someone in the Soviet Union comes up with the same conclusion. It's, it's something like this. You know, it's annoying when you see rich kids. They're, they're not working. <laughs> and you have to serve them. And it's just because they're parents. And so you'd like to tax it all away. But on the other hand, their parents have been slaving for all their life. And they end up doing nothing with the wealth except transferring it to the children. It just seems too cruel to take it away, to take all of it. So maybe we'll take, we don't want to take half of it. That's too much. A little under half, so about 40%. Yeah. And so there we are. So maybe we already have in the UK the optimal wealth tax. No, you're right about that the, in a way. but. People are living longer. So you, it's going to take a long time to realize that tax. If you have a wealth yeah. tax, you the get other, it every year. The other thing is, I talk a lot in my book about philanthropy. And ultimately, uh, I talk about, I don't know if you read Andrew Carnegie here. In 1879, he wrote a book, an article in a, mag, a US magazine. He was one of the richest men in America in the robber baron age. And he wrote an article called Wealth. It was republished within one year in London with a new title. It was called The Gospel of Wealth. And he had the arrogance to say, this was his theme in the article. The theme was that some people are smarter than others, when it especially when it comes to affairs, as he called it, which means business, <laughs> business administration, and that the capitalist system discovers the real geniuses. That's Andrew Carnegie. This was very self-serving. And he said, these people have a moral obligation to retire from business early and spend the rest of their life giving it away. And so that's what he said. Because, and you don't delegate that, to, or you have to delegate some of the activities, but you stay in charge and you give your whole fortune away before you die. And then he went and did just that. So he set up the Carnegie Endowment for Peace. He set up the Carnegie Institute for Technology. He built Carnegie Hall in New York. He gave Princeton University a rowing lake for their team called Lake Carnegie. Uh, and he also, he also brought, I think it was already a movement in the UK, a public library movement. He imported it to the United States and he created thousands of public libraries all over the country and then he died. And uh, that is the model and now Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have read that same book. It's coming back. It's a newly, it's not a bestseller, uh, that article which, an article which he converted into a book, uh, because it just offends and irritates anybody else who's not rich. Uh, but what it does say is that there, there is another, uh, uh, Gates and Buffett uh, uh, are, are trying to promote this. There is another solution to the inequality problem which is to encourage, it's a partial solution, encourage more philanthropy. And there is something, some merit, I think maybe Carnegie exaggerated it, but he did things. He, for example, he brought public libraries all over America. The government could have done it, it didn't do it. There's lots of, or, or Bill Gates uh, g took some of his Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation mm -hmm. money, and he sent it to a UK medical research uh, organization to find a cure for river blindness, which is a disease of the very poor people in Africa. And, uh, and uh, the UK government didn't do it. The US government didn't do it. The African governments were maybe in no position to do it. Why didn't those governments do it? Well, you can answer that for me. But Bill Gates did it. And I'm thinking that maybe it is evidence that the Carnegie theory is not so easily dismissed. And that um, a capitalism that allows inequality and uh, encourages philanthropy is not, is, a, is not bad. And by the way, in my indexation proposal, I'm saying that if inequality got much worse, we would raise taxes on the rich. 
And people say, I can't imagine how you could do that in the UK because the taxes are already so high on the rich. Some people say that. Maybe it was someone I met at a bank who said that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying, one thing that you can lessen, you can learn from history, is that whenever you raise taxes on the rich, a nice bone to throw the rich is to improve, increase charitable deduction uh, on the tax system. So in, in the US, tax history of the US, I, I know that better than the UK, but it's probably the same in the UK. The income tax went up sharply in World War I and World War II. The United States raised the top tax bracket to 94% during World War II. I think, and then, they, and then after the war, the tax rate slowly slid down until it hit Ronald Reagan, uh, where it hit the lowest. <laughs> but but the, th the thing is that uh, uh, whenever they did that, they also raised, they, they brought in a charitable deduction. Because, you know, it, it sounds sensible. Why should we take your money away from you if you were just about to give it to charity anyway? So I think that's the kind of thing we do. We, we make it more f wealth, more focused on charity, and we raise the taxes on those people. And another, another idea is a consumption tax, which Bob Frank has a book about. Somehow, somehow tax away selfish, conspicuous consumption and leave the charitable, the Andrew Carnegie type activities. Let them, ha let them put their names on university buildings. Let's take one more question. So I don't know who, how to, can you pay? <laughs> I don't know who to, I feel bad about. The gentleman about. here in the red shirt has been in the center for a while. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, my name is Eric. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the Open Yale course. It's been extremely helpful. Oh, great. Thank you for that. I was just wondering if you could give us your view on the situation in the Eurozone. Okay. <laughs> Big question, I know. Yeah, <laughs> just brief. Well, I already said that if they had taken my advice, there would be no problem. Yeah. <laughs> if Greece had financed with trills. You know how the Euro crisis developed? It, it started, uh, Greece didn't look like a problem. It, this was another thing that wasn't predicted. Uh, and, and Spain didn't have a high, really high debt to GDP rate. And people weren't predicting this. And then one day, one morning, someone saw that the, when they tried to refinance their short-term debt, the interest rate went up a little bit. And so it got noticed. And the newspapers reported, what's this? It just went up a little bit at first. And then people, economists were asked why, and then said, well, maybe people are worried that Greek, Greece won't repay its debt. And then, so then that starts a bubble. It starts a sequence, so then it goes up a little more because some people think, well, maybe that is that right? Maybe I, I guess I won't invest in Greek debt, and and then it gets more and more, and it attracts more and more public attention, uh, and then it becomes the interest rate gets so high, then it becomes a reality. Greece can't pay that debt anymore. I mean, there's going to be a taxpayer revolt, and then it all happens. Now, if Greece had financed by trills. <laughs> First of all, my trills are perpetual. There's no refinancing, OK? And, and, and moreover, even if there was an economic disaster, GDP, GDP had fell 7.5% in Greece in 2010. All that would mean is that their, their payments on the uh, trills would go down by 7.5%. They'd get an automatic bailout uh, from, from the market. And, uh, and there wouldn't be any, any, any of these moral dilemmas. So I, this doesn't exactly answer your question about what to do now. But what well, it does say that the, the thing is that we, sh uh, we should be taking the financial crisis as an opportunity to develop new and better financial institutions. Greece got itself leveraged. It got itself in a short-term run, in effect. And we can take the measures to, to make that impossible in the future. And the UK government should issue trills now <laughs> as a demonstration. UK, I think, is probably the most, in history, the most innovative uh, in finance in the world. So it's actually almost morally obligated <laughs> to set example for the rest of the world by doing at least a demonstration program on, that, on trills. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Schiller. That's a great note to finish on. And uh, he will stay here for a little longer. Um, his book about the ideas, you just talked a lot. The book will be on sale outside. You can go outside, buy the book, come back in through the other door, or you'll be directed exactly how you come back in. And Robert Schiller will be here to sign your book, if you wish.
Thank you very much.